In the 1730s, a copper mining craze took hold in the American colonies. Earlier attempts at finding gold had been abandoned. And now settlers and adventurers were seeking out deposits of bright green copper in the hills and ridges high above the fledgling settlements. While the stories of the American gold rush of 1849 have been well documented and widely told, the copper boom of the early 18th century has been all but forgotten. It is rarely mentioned in history books, and most of the mines dating to that time have faded into oblivion. In this episode, I will go in search of one such copper mine, dating to the 1730s, and investigate a tale of misfortune and murder. Get ready to go underground and back in time, deep into a colonial copper mine, now on Mines and Mysteries. The story of the settlement of America is littered with mining ventures. These early American mines have helped shape today's industrial world, yet only scant traces of them remain, their history hidden deep beneath our feet. But now, with the advent of new technologies, we can rediscover the world of the past in ways never before thought possible. My name is Mike Sandone, and it is my goal to seek out the very oldest mines in America, the ones dating all the way back to colonial times, to uncover artifacts and minerals that help tell their stories, to document and map the tunnels that snake through the earth, and to unravel an important but forgotten piece of American history. This is Minds and Mysteries. Copper was an extremely valuable metal in the 1700s, and like all valuable commodities, was being sought all across the American colonies. I have learned that the people who opened and operated these mines were usually wealthy landowners, merchants, or members of the clergy. The people who discovered the deposits were usually local farmers, hunters, or traders and the ones who would work the deposits were English or German miners who were brought to America by the people who leased or owned the mines. I turned up copper mines dating to the 1730s in town histories of Woodbury, Farmington, Wallingford, and Manchester, Connecticut, as well as North Arlington and Belleville, New Jersey, and some vague references to copper mines in York County, Pennsylvania, and Fairfax County, Virginia. While researching the sites in Connecticut, I turned up one dramatic story that seems to be attributed to several different mines. The story goes something like this. The copper ore from the mine was barreled up and carted to Hartford, where it was then shipped to New York. There it was put aboard two ships bound for England. Copper ore at the time was very valuable, and by law it could only be sold in England. As the story goes, one of the ships was captured by the French and the cargo seized. The other ship escaped the French, but sunk in the English Channel. Two or more of the mine officers escorting the copper ore to market died in the shipwreck. There is an unrelated story that tells that the minter of America's first copper coin and prominent metallurgist, Samuel Higley, died in a shipwreck in 1737 while taking his copper ore to market in England. Could this be the same shipwreck? There is nothing in the historical record to confirm or deny it. The similarities are certainly striking. But there is more to the story. 
okay, okay, okay. Upon learning of this misfortune, there was a quarrel among the remaining mine officers. That's, ever, that's everything we have. Well, I mean, you're never. taking the blame for this. It should be in my name still. No, that's you, what we you agreed know, that's on. That's not true. No, you are incorrect. We're not agreeing to this. Oh, we're not agreeing to this. You're right about that. No, no get, get in. Good luck. Facts. As legend goes, this quarrel resulted in one man being killed. It is not known if it was a duel, an act of sheer violence, or a combination of both. The story ends with the body being hastily disposed of. One account tells that the body was dropped down the shaft and the mine abandoned. But at which mine did this happen? I have found the story attached to the Wallingford Mine, the Simsbury Mine, and the Golden Parlor Mine. Of the known 1730s Connecticut mines, the Simsbury Mine is the most unlikely because it was later purchased by the state and turned into a prison. There is no tale of a body being found when this happened. Although dating to the correct time period, the tale is not attached to the Woodbury Mine, and there is no shaft there deep enough to conceal a body. The location of the Farmington Mine is lost to history. That leaves the Wallingford Mine and the Golden Parlor Mine. There is also a copper mine in Manchester that was in existence in the 1730s. But unlike the Golden Parlor and Wallingford Mines, its history during colonial times has been entirely lost. I will now set out to see which of these mines I can locate that may have a shaft where a body could be concealed. Upon visiting the Connecticut Historical Society, I turned up a rather cryptic map that shows the location of the Manchester mine. And in traditional treasure map fashion, the mine is marked with an X. The rough location of the mine is also shown on a map dated 1731. This map dates all the way back to the time when the land that is now the town of Manchester was called the Five Mile Tract. This tract of land was purchased from the son of the famous Mohegan chief and warrior, Uncas. The mine lot is clearly shown on the 1731 map, certainly a good start. But then I make an even more interesting find, a map showing a shaft and an adit with landmarks and an arrow indicating magnetic north. That's all the info I need. Overlaying the hand-drawn map over a modern map yields an approximate search area. Now let's overlay that with a LiDAR map. That's what we are looking for. The LiDAR map reveals several pits indicative of mining operations. Now let's go out and take a look. So I was just over at the Manchester mine and I was attempting to find the adit to the mine, the entrance to the mine, by using the old map. 
And what I did is I basically just took a bearing off the old map using magnetic north on the map. And I attempted to find the, the adit by finding a bearing from the shaft, which the shaft, although it is very soil eroded, is still, is still there. So I took a bearing off that and there was no, there's no way that there's an adit off that bearing. So I either took, did something wrong with the map, took the, the bearing wrong or the map is inaccurate, but uh, there's really no way that I would be able to find the adit using that bearing. So I was a little disappointed there. So I came over here um, in search of the golden parlor mine. And I'm not sure if this is roughly the right place forward or not. I'm just kind of doing a recon and I'm back behind the cemetery here and the golden parlor mine is another 1730s mine. So roughly around the same time that the Manchester mine was noted on the five mile tract map we have in 1736 a mine called the golden parlor mine being worked in what was then Wallingford and it was really only worked for one year before it was abandoned. I think it's gonna take a lot of research. There's, there's, there's just not a lot to go by here. So it's starting to get dark here and I'm gonna head back. Um, I'll have to do a little bit better research on the golden parlor mine here and pull up LiDAR and see if I can find any, any evidence of the mine because I'm just not turning anything up. Okay, so I'm getting ready to head back over to the Manchester mine. And I realized that on my last trip there, I made actually a really rookie mistake and I forgot a very crucial piece of information. So when I took the bearing off the 1840 map, I forgot to compensate for the change in declination over time. Declination is the difference between true north and magnetic north. And that's going to change a little bit every year. So the map was marked as magnetic north and... I obviously set my compass to magnetic north and tried to find it and didn't really come up with anything that looked really correct. And keep in mind, this mine has really, there's no tailings pile because the adit was on a river bank. So there's no clues at all where to dig. It I have to be dead on. Otherwise, I, I mean, there's a, there's a whole hillside to dig. I would never find it. So I have to be dead on with the map. And this is assuming that the map is accurate. So I went up and I took the, the bearing 260 degrees, went, went down to that point where it uh, was on the riverbank. And it was not, there was, it just, it didn't really look right. Then I, then I realized that I did not compensate for the change in declination from 1840 till now. So I pulled up the, um, historic uh, declination calculator and it stated that in Hartford in, in 1840 the declination was about seven degrees and I mean that's way different than the declination today it was definitely like the moment in Indiana Jones where you know, the Germans were digging in the wrong place because they didn't have this crucial piece of information Belloc's staff is too long they're, they're digging, digging in, in the, the wrong place, place. <laughs> and because they didn't have that crucial piece of information, they were digging in the wrong place. That is exactly how I feel right now. I was not in the right place because I didn't have this crucial piece of information pertaining to the change in declination. So I'm gonna change the declination on the compass. I'm going to take that bearing. I'm going to go exactly where that bearing takes me and I am going to just dig. And I'm gonna see what I find. an interesting spot because it looks like there's some sort of wood. It's also water coming out. Interesting. And it's about the right place where the adit should be. I don't know. I mean, it could just be a tree branch. I think I should follow the water. Right, this is definitely some kind of plank. It really looks flat on the top. And we got the water coming out here. I mean, this is like, I was here for literally five minutes and I found something interesting. This is unbelievable. I'm gonna follow this in. I trenched in another um, two feet or so and the pickaxe actually 
stuck in the wood. I, I really think I'm on top of a timber at it. It's stuck right into a piece of wood. Pull the piece out. I am almost 100% sure that that grain is chestnut, which is a wood that literally does not exist in these woods anymore. That looks like the grain of chestnut. It's very open grain. And chestnut is a very rot resistant wood. So if this was, if the last time that this adit was enterable was 1830, in the 1830s, it's possible that chestnut could last underground for that time. It's very possible. This plank has some very weird burnt material and it could be rot. Yeah, maybe it's tar. Maybe they tarred the wood before they put it in and that's why it's lasted so long. I mean, that could be the, that may well be the wood that they put in before 1731. Who knows? And I think the black stuff is tar. All right, so I, I think I'm dead on this thing. This is, this is really looking good. So I'm about to pull down the, as much of the overburden as, as possible to see if I can expose some bedrock. So I'm gonna close up the hole when I do that. So I wanna take a quick video of the hole before I close it up. Um, but this is, I mean, this within five minutes, I, I, I located what I think is a several hundred, an adit that has been lost for a very long time. All right, so I trenched all the way up as high as I can, and I didn't hit any bedrock. I went pretty high up. I, I covered back my, my hole back up here. So, okay, now I have a different plan. So here's some bedrock here. I'm gonna follow this over. So there's bedrock. There's bedrock. There's one of my old test holes, and here's my main dig. So all I have to do is follow that over, and we will know something. Okay, I did find um, another clue that I'm looking for here. So here's the bedrock. So here's the trench. Here's the bedrock, and I followed it up this way, and here's more bedrock. As I swung my pickaxe into the ground, I felt it sink into a void. Did I just find the entrance to the Manchester mine? The adit shown on the old map? I peered in. I couldn't believe my eyes. I had indeed found an adit tunnel penetrating deep into blackness. This is absolutely crazy. As I squeezed in, I was met with disappointment. Yeah. The tunnel was blocked. Oh, we got it. It's filled. What happened here? I don't feel any airflow coming through. I don't think anyone's been in here since the 1830s. I really don't. What is coating the wall? And I'm gonna head back outside. So there's the attic. Okay, here we go. So that was an absolutely incredible find. I cannot believe that I found that. But at the same time, it wasn't pure luck. So I'm really excited to dig through this fill and see what is gonna be just past the fill. There may be tools left behind. There may be artifacts left behind from the original miners, or at least some information in the way that mine was worked that we can learn about how these colonial mines were worked. So I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to mount an expedition to dig through this fill and find out what's on the other side of it. Uh, I can't look. I'm assuming this is pretty thick. This rock's okay. We'll, we'll be careful. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at how far we in, are in here, yeah. we're pretty well under that hillside. Yeah. We returned a few days later and began burrowing our way through the dirt fill. As 
I worked my way in with a warren hoe. A hint of blackness revealed itself. Did we actually find the other side? What? <laughs> For me the GoPro. Air pocket. What do you see? Yeah. Woo! Woo! You're being watered. No. <laughs> yeah, right. Go be quiet. No possible way. Oh my god, I hear the water dripping. All right, we're in, we're in. I mean, we're, we're okay, we're on the right track. I mean, this is like one of the very few colonial copper mines that exist in the country, and we're getting in it. Or at least we'll know something in the next hour. I only have doubts about five minutes ago. <laughs> you always have doubts just before we find something. That's how we know we're on the right track when Steve starts having doubts. Okay, we're gonna be close. Going through, you might have to dig me up. Yeah, it's a nice, nice clean arch tunnel. Not that far because I'm up on it. It looks like extremely deep water. A strange feeling washes over me when I enter a place untouched for such a long time. I believe that this type of wow. exploration is the closest thing to going back in time. Yeah, there's a deep shaft going straight down. I cannot believe I have found a perfectly preserved wood-lined mine shaft. In mining terms, this shaft is called a winds, because it does not extend all the way up to the surface. But what lies at the bottom? I need to find out. Oh my god, I can't believe this. Wind is cold out. <laughs> oh, it's windy. Well, look at this, so we have the 300 feet of tether. Pretty much everything we'll need to find the bottom of this winds. We return a week later with the equipment needed to fully explore the mine. An inflatable raft and an ROV, or remotely operated underwater vehicle. All right, so we're back here at the mine, and unfortunately, the, our dig has collapsed, and we're gonna need to dig through this to get to the flooded winds to send the ROV down. So uh, hopefully it didn't collapse too bad, and we can dig it back out. The you know what, Mike? It's not that bad. Good. There's still airspace going through. Just like one of the, maybe like the side wall collapse, not the ceiling. Good. Which is nice. I inflate my pack raft and carefully glide over the deep shaft trying hard not to puncture the raft on the sharp rock. I reach the other side and peer up into what was once an open void, but has since been filled with rocks too large to move. I don't see any artifacts, I don't see any war. Right, I'm here. There is no going forward. Now we can only go down. Gliding over the winds, and we're unsure. All right, so get the ROV out. Uh, so last night I ran it through the checks. Hopefully the ROV will run pretty well. All right, so let's test the motor. Mike prepares the ROV. He does a systems check. Well, let's test the lights now. Oops, wrong. Yeah, there we go. 
Then he crawls through the fill to the edge of the winds, sets the ROV in the water, and carefully crawls back to the safety of the tunnel. We're going down. Okay, so yeah, there's some metal fastening the ladder to the wood. The wood is in such good condition, I can't believe how solid it is. Ooh, look at that. Mysterious. Look at, you. look at that blackness. <laughs> it's so mysterious. I'm feeling like this weird feeling of euphoria, like almost like we're going back in time here. A lot of rusty particles down there. Imagine who the last person was who climbed down that ladder. And now we're going down there with an ROV. Imagine being at the top of that ladder and looking down and seeing two men down there drilling. Oh! It's a box. Oh my god! Oh, there oh there. you can see it's hollow! <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, well we gotta sh it's, it's probably for ventilation. It's probably- yeah. it was probably an air pipe that where they had compressed air blowing down so, to, to clear out the the dust from drilling. Is that a joint there? That's, that's, that's a joint. A joint. Yeah, look so at that. that's, that's why, why it's tapered. It. Yep. yep, see how they attach it? This is something that probably nobody in the world knows right now. <laughs> how they attached square air, air tubing together. Yeah, they tapered it. That's why that bottom one had a taper. That makes complete sense now. Now we understand. See, we just, we learned something that has been probably That's forgotten. Amazing. And also, because the deeper you, you go down the shaft, you need to be able to connect new sections. You, yep. But we just don't know if they were profitable, if, you know, we don't know anything about it. And that's why we're out here doing the, the exploration to find out. Oh, there's copper. There was green. So Mike is packing up the ROV and the, the, the ROV has uh, successfully completed its mission with only a little bit of battery power left. Now we know that this exploration is complete. This, this mission is complete. And we learned a lot from this trip. You can just get up and just see details that are frozen in time underwater. So we learned a couple things about the winds, it had a ventilation pipe. We learned how they joined the ventilation pipes together, which was really interesting. They actually cut a chamfer on the planks so that it was tapered, and that would fit into another section of ventilation pipe that was tapered, and those sections would just sit on top of each other so that when they're drilling and blasting down there, they're able to blow fresh air in and clear the dust from drilling and blasting so that they can keep keep working their way down. I have never seen wooden ventilation pipe before in any mine. The other thing that was just amazing was how well pre preserved the wood was. The, the timbering was still showing saw marks. It was that well preserved. And the ROV, it can focus at only a couple inches away from something and you need to get up close yeah. on it when there's silt built up in the water and we could see vertical saw marks that were indicative of a pit saw or an up and down sawmill. It, it was that well preserved. When I imagined this ROV run, I never imagined a ventilation pipe yeah. being in there. And we didn't think it was a ventilation pipe at first. We thought it was a timber that was holding the structure yep. together. It was only because of the clarity of the image produced by that ROV that we could get up on that. And, and of course, Mike's expert piloting we dove under and looked up and you could see yeah. the the opening of the of the pipe going up it was it was not a solid timber like we thought it was actually a and mike was the first one to observe that that there were nails holding it together it was not a solid timber and he got up underneath it and just maneuvered that rov so we can get like a two second glimpse of the inside of it being hollow and 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 therefore proving that this was a ventilation pipe and not a structural timber Although there is no concrete connection between the Manchester mine and the murder story, it did exist during the same time that the story is believed to have taken place. Who knows, maybe some of the ore was even shipped aboard the same two vessels that were lost at sea. But we will never know because all records of the mine 
dating to colonial times, have been lost. While our expedition into the Manchester mine did not reveal any skeletons in the shaft, it did reveal information perhaps even more valuable. First-hand knowledge of how these mines were worked long ago. I will continue to seek out mines that date to the 1730s, and hopefully one day find solid evidence of the murder at the mine. But until that day comes, this fascinating story will simply remain in the realm of old Connecticut folktales. <laughs>